everyone. My name is Brian Flick. I'm the Associate Marine Extension Director with the University of Georgia's Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant Program. And I am Dr. Jennifer Sweeney Tooks. I'm an applied anthropologist at Georgia Southern University. And we're going to tag team the following presentation talking about a commercial fishing infrastructure assessment project that we did that's focused specifically on Georgia shrimp boats and uh, haul outs or what we call railways. So first, we want to acknowledge uh, Georgia Department of Natural Resources, the Coastal Resources Division, particularly Dr. Carolyn Belcher and Julie Califf, who uh, provided us um, great insights and uh, really uh, valuable resources for us to continue to be able to do this project. So just a little bit about uh, shrimping in Georgia, if you're not familiar. This is our largest commercial fishing sector, um, and it's helped contributes to a uh, $50 million commercial fishing industry here in the state. And shrimping has deep cultural ties to our coastal communities. Um, and um, when we look at commercial fishing in general, shrimping is really an integral part of the coastal community. And it's everything from the people that are harvesting the shrimp and the vessels themselves uh, to landing it, processing it, and shipping it out, uh, which really make up the, help make up the commercial uh, shrimp industry. But we also know that there's multiple ongoing challenges that the industry faces. And when it particularly comes with vessels and the infrastructure, we know that many of the shrimp vessels um, and the docks that support them, uh, where the shrimp's landing, processed, and stored are in various stages of disrepair. These deficiencies are often the result of a combination of factors, and which can include but not be limited to just past storm activities, our daily tidal inundations, neglect, other financial burdens, and even regulatory constraints. And we know when we have multiple um, issues that are affecting the industry, one other that sometimes happens is when we have um, fishery resource uh, disasters. And this is uh, a, a dis fishery resource disaster is when uh, refers to an unexpected or a large decrease in um, stockpile mass or other changes that really result in significant loss of access to the fishery resource. Um, and particularly for Georgia, in the past 10, 11 years, we've had two uh, fishery disaster declarations um, for shrimp. In 2013, due to heavy rainfall events in the late spring and summer um, that led to recruitment failure, as well as in 2018, having prolonged uh, winter temperatures that stayed below about 48 degrees Fahrenheit or about 9 degrees Celsius uh, for a substantial period also had impacts on the stock. And this does result in financial burdens for the industry. And often uh, the way that process works uh, as an ent entity, in this case, maybe a local government, um, will request a declaration uh, to the NOAA Fisheries through the Department of Commerce, who will refer or who will um, review the criteria to see if it meets the, the standard definition of that. Um, and if that happens, then um, they'll, they'll establish a declaration and the state, uh, DNR, will then uh, apply for that funding and that funds go back as a way once they've calculated what is that economic loss those funds will go back to the state when this happens though um, the state does try to um, go with the preferred preference of the fishermen of having direct payouts in fact uh, this is usually what fishermen want is have individual uh, payouts according to what they are um, based on their landing records um, but when this happens, though, this is not there's additional funding and we're talking, you know, multiple million dollars um, and there's no actual guidance, though, beyond that of where the state can invest these uh, their funding back into it. And there's been several questions raised. Um, and for instance, does it go back? You know, one, once they've done those maximum payouts, can it go into vessel repair or repairing the uh, railways? And if you're not familiar with railways, a uh, picture of it on the top right, basically these are haul out areas um, that use a cradle to pull boats out of the water so they can work um, underneath in the hull. Um, but they are needed for that vessel repair. And then just the general dock infrastructure. So whether we're talking about the buildings themselves, uh, where the, the shrimp is processed, uh, you know, the ice holds, any other type of the docks themselves, any other of that infrastructure that's needed to support. Um, and that's a big question of where can the state invest funding um, beyond those maximum payouts should future disasters occur. So to 
despite the importance of this infrastructure, the vessels, the actual physical docks themselves, um, there really hasn't been a comprehensive assessment done on Georgia's working waterfronts. Um, Jennifer actually led a project several years ago that did a social census of the waterfronts. And even though it addressed some components of this, it really addressed this issue from a different lens. So the physical infrastructure itself really has not been looked at depth. And this is something that DNR has, uh, is interested because such information can assist the state um, in identifying and prioritizing the most critical repairs and enhancements needed to help sustain the industry um, and if future uh, disaster funding uh, comes available or even other potential um, mechanisms that could potentially come back. So with that being said, um, we did get some funding through CRD, actually, from some of the disaster funding. Um, and really what we're looking to do in this part one project, Vessels and Railways, we're looking to identify opportunities to in improve infrastructure and industry sustainability. Um, and our goal here is really to provide guidance to CRD to use in case that um, the future funding that it, it, it comes in beyond what they can do with those direct payouts, how can they um, maximize that return on investment? And when coming up with this project, there's two guiding research questions that Jennifer and I really uh, try to focus on. And first off, what, what is the current state of the commercial shrimp vessel fleet, including what repairs are commonly completed? Um, how are they done? Where and at, at what cost to the, to the shrimpers? And then the other um, guiding question on this, how can Georgia DNR um, best support the ongoing sustainability of the industry? And um, this is a key aspect, too, of getting the input from the industry members um, themselves that will hopefully help DNR make some of these future decisions. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer, and she's going to talk a little bit about just how we set this project up and go into some of the general findings. Thanks, Brian. So I get to jump in um, with my, my nerdy slide right off the bat and talk to you about the sampling frame for this project. Uh, so when we started this project, we consulted with Julie Califf. Thanks, Julie, who provided us the 2023 database of 98 state resident food trawler permits. So there were 98 food trawler permits at that time. And we needed to systematically narrow that population um, because of funding and time frame of needing to complete this project. And so we made a series of choices that all pointed back at those guiding research questions that Brian mentioned. And so the first thing that we did was to eliminate any vessels from that database that were less than 38 feet in length or that had an outboard engine. And we did this because those vessels were responsible for less than 2% of the food shrimp landings in Georgia. They were likely to be trailer, trailerable boats <laughs> able to go on trailers, meaning that they would have less costly repairs and maintenance. And so those types of vessels aren't commonly used for commercial shrimping. And so we, we really wanted to winnow down to people who were commercial shrimping. Uh, the next thing that we did was to condense the permit holders to a single entry for every person. In some cases, we had multiple permits for the same person. Um, so we wanted to make sure that each person was only on that list once. And then we sorted that list that was substantially shorter by the county of residence. Um, and so at that point, we had 53 eligible permit holders. And so we sorted these by the county where they resided and were then able to determine what percentage of our 25 interviews that we were able to conduct needed to be represented by each of those counties. And so you can see here on the next slide what that looked like. Um, we had that identified number of eligible permit holders, not permits again, but permit holders per county, determine proportionately how many of those interviews for, should be from each of those counties. And we found that in some counties, there was only a single permit holder. So obviously you can't interview half of a person. So we pulled those six counties together and recruited from all of them, which worked out to be one interview from each of three of those six counties. And that let us hit our sampling goal of 25 interviews. So our goal in this task overall was to solicit information from those 25 permit holders about the working status of their vessels, about their maintenance and repair needs, and the associated time and costs of those repairs and that maintenance. And then we took that information and paired it with information from the two railways. And so that's what my very fancy set of images here is showing you. And then we took all that information and crafted what was sort of our master price list, a collaborative price list, and also a way to determine the interest level of the railway partners. And so we were looking here about perspectives on potential programs for funding vessel repairs through the railways and then the benefits and the challenges um, associated with an initiative such as this. 
So I'm going to provide some basic um, stats from some of the information that we collected from the interview participants. When it came to the actual vessels themselves, the, the mean average uh, age uh, was almost 48 years old. And as you can see, we had vessels that were built um, back from the, the 1940s, uh, the newest one being in the uh, 1990s. As far as average length, um, mean length was 62 feet. And you can see, again, we went from that 39 feet um, up to um, just over 80 feet as far as the length. Then we also asked about hull types. And as you can see, uh, about 40%, which is our biggest category, were uh, fiberglass only, whereas um, about 28% were uh, fiberglass over wood. 24% were steel, and then we had about 8% of the 25 uh, interviewees uh, that had a wood hull. And we also asked about insurance coverage, and you can see that um, only 36% of the 25 um, captains that we interviewed had some or had no insurance. I'm sorry, had some kind of insurance, where 64% had no insurance. And we know that this continues to be a, a broad uh, issue in the industry affecting abilities to get repairs done. So some of the other input that we got from the people that we interviewed, on average, captains and owners reported completing about 77% of vessel repairs and maintenance themselves uh, versus outsourcing it to professionals. And when I say themselves, that was either the captain themselves or their crews. Um, and we often heard just the cost um, of trying to outsource was prohibitive and trust was a big factor on that too when it came to the repairs. Um, when it did come to haul out frequency, um, again, it was about two years on average where the captains uh, would pull their boats out. We certainly heard, you know, for those who had wood boats, the ideal frequency would be something like every year just because of the fact that it's made of wood, whereas steel hulls could be potentially up to three years, but combined on average a little bit over two years. And um, you can see about 64% of those we interviewed had hauled out their vessel at least once between uh, the years 20. Uh, 2022 and 2023 uh, for some kind of work. And when they did pull the, their vessels out, um, some of the most common types of repairs that we heard was scraping and painting the hull uh, to mitigate, obviously, fouling, replacing zincs to mitigate electrolysis, and then uh, repairing leaks. And this is true for all hulls, but particularly those wood hulls, um, they had to be very mindful of that. And then working on bottoms, such as working on kill coolers or repairing shafts and propellers were also common types of maintenance that we heard. Now that Brian's given you some of the quantitative information, I get to share with you some of the key findings that came out of the interviews. And so for each of these, I'll, I'll let you know what that finding was, but then also provide a few words from some of the captains and owners just to illustrate uh, the types of, of stories and experiences that we heard. Um, so the first thing that we found was that there really has been an ever widening gap between the expense of running a shrimp vessel and the current profits and opportunities for profit. And they said things like, my main issue with shrimping is, of course, the fuel price kills me. You basically get for shrimp what you're getting for a gallon of fuel. You can't make it. And of course, those types of, you know, costs and prof lack of profits really directly impacts the repairs and the maintenance that are possible for any vessel owner. And we found at the same time that the cost of parts have really increased dramatically, whereas a lot of the quality of the available parts have really decreased substantially. And they found in many cases, parts can be difficult to obtain. Some of the traditional suppliers have closed. And, uh, and one example that the one Fisher told us, I used to have GMs, GM engines, and I would always go with GM parts because they seemed to last much longer. They were made better. And he said, but, you know, nowadays you get all parts from foreign countries and stuff is a lot cheaper because it's made out of cheap metal and it's made cheaper. And he said, this is understandable. They can sell them cheaper, but they don't last. And so what they're finding is even if they're buying a cheaper part, it's lasting for such a short amount of time that in the long run, they're spending far more on these parts than they would have originally paying more for each part. Another key theme that came up was about refurnishing or rebuilding old parts. And in many cases, these would result in a higher quality product than purchasing a new part. Uh, one, one person was explaining to us that he was negotiating with a person who was helping him and working on his vessel. And he told the person, I'd rather have the wheels that he has right there on the vessel. And of course, the, the helper or the person he was working on it said, you know, these are 20 years old. And he said, yeah, I know, but each time you rebuild them, they're better. He said, if they were brand new, they would have lasted three seasons. But when you rebuild them, I get five seasons out of them. So he really was trying to emphasize that it's better to rebuild than it is to buy new. 
um, because as he said, when he gets through with them, they're better than they are when I buy them new. Other vessel owners reported using non-marine parts in creative ways because of unavailable items or poor quality parts. Um, one told us they used to have a brass pump uh, on their de for a deck pump, and all you had to do was replace the rubber portion in it, and then that would just be a couple of hundred dollars. And he said, but that little part, I went up to $500 to $600, it went to $800. He said, now it's just so expensive, it's unreasonable. And so he and his family had gotten very creative. He said the last time he put a generator on his boat, he went to Home Depot and bought a sprinkler system pump. It was 250 bucks. I got 17 years out of it. And then he was really excited to tell us, I can't wait to try the one I've got at the house. It's a jacuzzi pump. I got it out of an old jacuzzi that was about to go in the trash. So you can see, you know, it was almost a challenge for him to be able to use these parts in ways that they weren't originally intended to be used. We also completed these interviews with railways and came out with some key themes here. Um, some of the things that we learned, uh, again, I'm gonna sort of give you the finding and then illustrate it for you, is there really is a huge diversity in the types of work that each vessel needs during the haul out. And then there's a lot of variation in the cost of doing similar work on different vessels. You know, trying to pin down a common price for a common thing that had to be done to the vessel was really almost impossible for folks. Um, one person at a railway told us, you know, it really would depend on what they wanted to pay for or how much work or whatever, because every boat that comes up is all different. Uh, this might be two grand, but oh, we're on a different boat. That might be four grand. You really don't know until you see what you've got to do. And also coming through here is the fact that um, when he said what they want to pay for, people on, who are working the railways and running the railways are really used to having to work with very limited budgets and people having only a small amount or X amount of money to spend at any given time and really having to be creative within that budget. Another key th finding that came through is that railway work is often hull centric. It's only work that cannot be performed on the water. And that's the only type of work that's being done on the railways because a lot of the work that's performed on vessels can be done off of the railway. And so we asked what sorts of things were done. Um, we heard answers like this. We do fiberglass patches, fiberglass boats in general, you know, there's not much to do to them. You scrape, you wash, you paint, zincs. Most of the leaks got to be fixed on the railway. Other than that, that, well, that's just really the main reason they get on the railway. So that's the main reason they come up. We also found that Georgia railways have limits on the size boats that they can pull out of the water for work. Um, this was generally related to a really complicated set of calculations that had to be done, not just the length of the vessel, but things like vessel draft, environmental conditions, the height of the tide. He said it really, one of, one of the gentlemen told us it really depends on the keel and the depth. And he gave several examples of this particular boat that would only draw 11 or 12 feet of water and they could pull that one. But this other boat only drew eight feet of water, but it was bigger, so they couldn't pull that one. And so he ended by saying it really depends on how much water she draws, the vessel draws. We also really learned that it's increasingly difficult to find locations outside of the state to haul out vessels for maintenance and repairs, especially without a steel hull or vessel insurance. And a big shout out to Brian here for making lots of calls to facilities all the way from Beaufort, North Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida, and really learned that most facilities prefer to use a travel lift rather than a railway. And most of them are very disinclined to take any vessels that don't have a steel hull, that don't have vessel insurance. And uh, perhaps a key feature and something really significant is that most of them are requiring that only their own staff do the work on the railway, which is in contrast to the two railways in Georgia that really work with the owners and the captains to allow them to help with the work to keep the bills a little bit lower. Really a key thing that came out of these interviews with the railways is there's definitely a level of interest in collaborating with Georgia DNR CRD to find a way to fund vessel work through the railways. You know, they were each very careful to say details needed to be worked out in advance of beginning any project. But, you know, as one gentleman told us, the railway would be a prime tool to use to keep the fleet up. You've got to have railways. And it's just coming up with a way to find a way that's kind of somewhat fair. He said, I'll go along with anything, but it is my property. And this railway hasn't been very profitable, only working with shrimp boats. So there's definitely some hope, but also a little bit of, of apprehension and concern that it's done well. So as part of these interviews, Georgia-based participants were also asked for input on how the state could invest back into the industry if and when this future disaster, 
disaster funding or other funding becomes available and direct payouts have already been maxed out. And so participants were really pleased to be asked for their input, um, but several, many of them warned us <laughs> <laughs> that despite its very best efforts, it's highly unlikely that uh, DNR, CRD will be able to please everyone, um, that there are there's just no way to make everyone happy, but that the attempts were certainly pleasing to people. They were encouraged to hear these questions. A lot of the responses that we initially received in these interviews centered around issues that really cannot be solved by increased DNR CRD investment. Things like stopping imported shrimp or reopening closed areas or the cost of fuel. Right? But many other suggestions were also made that really do fall much closer to the realm of possibility for support from DNR CRD. A common thing that came up was they would appreciate assistance with fuel, nets, rigging, these things that are the most rapidly used, most rapidly worn out while fishing. Uh, as an example, one gentleman told us, I say they can do an equipment fund for ropes, shackles, nets, doors, cables. Because the way things are going, if you get behind the eight ball a little bit and you get another thing happen, you're done. So he was saying, even if you're keeping up your boat as well as you possibly can and as well as you can afford to, all it takes is losing two nets and you're, you're down. You, you can't fish at all. So having that sort of resource would be really helpful. Many others also suggested investment in and assistance with paying for the mandated bycatch reduction gear, the TEDs, the birds. Uh, one person told us all these restrictions on the nets, they can compensate on the TEDs and stuff like that, which the government makes us pull. We have to, or we don't go fishing. So he was saying, have them put in or taken out or provide the ones that we need, that that would be really helpful to people in the industry. Um, many suggested assistance, financial assistance with the mandated safety gear, things like flare kits and wraps and life jackets. Uh, there, a really great explanation came from one gentleman who told us, if you're going to make me have this life raft, buy this life raft for me. If you're going to make me have all the safety stuff, you buy it. Nobody wants to go out there and be unsafe. But if you don't have the money, you're not going to take the money from your family or your children to buy a life jacket or a life raft or a flare because you're thinking, I'm going fishing. And if I make it back, good. And if I don't, then well, that stuff happens. Right, so definitely a sense of having to be really strategic about how they invested what little money they had. Another key thing that came up was supporting the docks and the railways. They pointed out that keeping some of these local railways open, that would be good for the majority of the fishermen. Other people said the docks, we need to help them so they can help us. And many had really long um, and in, in thoughtful feedback about which docks they were docking out, what things would help that dock. Um, stay viable and stay operating. And a set of surprising answers to us was that more than one person brought up increased training for and or collaboration with law enforcement, environmental enforcement. Um, we, we heard several stories that sort of went along the lines of this one, uh, saying, you know, that they would like to see more professional attitudes about those who are boarding their vessels um, suggesting that perhaps they could be boarded at the dock instead of doing it during the day when they're on the water. Um, and, and, you know, hearing these interviews at first, we, we said, are you, wait, are, are we understanding you correctly? You want them to invest money in better training of enforcement officers? And the responses we would hear would say, yes. Um, and for example, this gentleman who said, I would say better training. That way they don't have to teach them when they come on the boat. He said, if they want to board us, if the state makes them do that, then get on our boat and bada bing, bada boom. OK, we're going to let you guys get back to work. But he did say they hold us up sometimes way too long um, and they're not always real professional about it. When they brought that guy on the boat the other day, they were training the guy and he was really indignant about the training portion of that. Um, the final really common thing that was suggested to us had to do with marketing or branding campaign for Georgia shrimp. Um, as one person told us, I think advertisements about the difference between farm raised shrimp, that's going to help you be able to make more money so you can keep your boats up. He said marketing is the only way to make our shrimp different. Uh, and another person was really emphatic. I don't want a handout. What I want to see is our product become valuable again. So thought that investing in marketing or, or branding would help increase demand, which would then let him earn uh, a better income, a better livelihood, and be able to invest back into his vessel. So one of the products of this project was the master price list that combined all of the information that we obtained. Uh, but the vast diversity in prices was very surprising to us. 
Uh, we expected that we would be calculating ranges of prices, but really not how vast that range would be. Um, all of the findings that I described earlier led to price ranges that were often thousands or tens of thousands of dollars different. <laughs> so this information paired with the industry suggestions of what types of things would be the most helpful to have DNR's assistance with means really only certain repairs or certain work make sense to even attempt. And so those are really the things that we emphasized in this presentation. I will mention this master price list is in our report, um, which will be accessible to you. So if you would like to dig into that more closely, we encourage you to do that. But what we found overall is that even, even when we had an idea of what the, the money should be spent on, how to do that became the next question. And so one of the things that we asked the interview subjects was how could the state invest in the industry if and when this sorts of funding becomes available? And, and I'd like to emphasize again that participants were very pleased to be asked for their input, but warned us that it's unlikely that, that DNR CRD is going to be able to please everyone. Um, so regardless of the approach, and I'll go through very briefly a, a variety of different approaches that they proposed to us, the method of payment is really important. It's really crucial that this reimbursement or payment, whether it's to railways or vendors or shrimpers, that it be timely. Um, and there was a, a lot of mention of previous disaster funding that had taken a very long time to be returned to fishers and great frustration and how that had impeded their businesses. So we, we can't emphasize the timeliness quite strongly enough. Um, but this is a complex looking slide. What I'd like to do is just highlight what is going on here. These are the different ways that captains and owners suggested this money be spent, how it could be done. And so you'll see across the top, we have a model. We sort of named these different models to, for ease of referring to them. And then underneath each of those models that are in the darker blue, you'll see a definition of what that meant, how people describe them to us. And if you take the time to sit and look with this, you'll see that it goes, it, uh, there's a broad spectrum of answers here. Things like every person getting exactly the same amount of money to be used on repairs, or people getting the sufficient amount of money to get the same thing fixed, even if it's going to cost differently on each boat. Some folks suggested that matching funds should be required, that DNR should not invest money that the boat owner isn't also willing to invest. While others pointed to triage models from emergency rooms where maybe it's important to keep the fleet floating by really fixing the least functional vessels first to preserve the fleet. Um, the exact opposite of that would be supporting the productive, right? That whoever the most productive members of the fleet are, those with the higher landings, invest in them, um, which is similar then to the high functioning, maintaining the high functioning. Very different, of course, were things like emergency funds that perhaps DNR should hold that money in reserve um, and only fund sudden repairs, right? Not general maintenance, maintenance, but rather vessels that have been maintained are operating but have sudden emergencies. And then, of course, regulatory support that perhaps they could fund things that aren't necessarily part of keeping the vessel running, um, such as a TED or a safety raft, but that are definitely required by regulation to be present in order to function. And then you'll see our last category really had to do with uh, the, the things that are outside of probably the scope of possibility for a project like this. So uh, we're going to stop there. I'd like to point out to you that um, that was the first stage of a much longer project. And so the first part was Vessels and Railways, which is now wrapped up. Uh, the second part is starting today, actually. <laughs> it, started, it started a little bit in March um, with students uh, from Georgia Southern coming down and working with us. But we'll be now be moving on to the docks and assessing the infrastructure at the docks in, across coastal Georgia. But I do invite you to take a look at the full report, which can be found online. Um, so if you're interested in pointing your smartphone camera app at this code, it will take you to the website where you can find the full report for more information. Um, but even possibly more importantly, we'd love to hear from you all if you have questions or we can assist with understanding any of this. Um, please, don't, please don't hesitate to contact us. Reach out to Brian or myself. As our contact information is right here. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Flick to wrap up today. Yeah, I just want to say thank you again for uh, to DNR for the support for this project and uh, just echo Jen, uh, Jennifer's comments. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. And I hope everybody enjoys their day. Thank you. Thanks a lot.